When the outbreak began, there was no indication of how serious it might become. What we know what has caused millions of people to drop dead, and that's COVID-19. You know, there's nothing unusual about a hydrogel that's even uh, been used pharmaceutically. Mucus is a hydrogel. Mucus, the thing that lines the, the normal trachea, that's a hydrogel. And uh, it's just a hydrated gel. That's all it means is that you have water hydrating that gel. Uh, jello is a hydrogel where you, have, where you have a gelatinous material and it's hydrated by water. So there's nothing unusual about that, nothing unusual about that even in medical formulations. Whether there's hydrogels in this, it's not some, if there is, it's not some special nanotechnology hydrogel. Hydrogels are very common materials. CRISPR is, is, a, is a new technique which is for gene editing, that is for taking out segments of DNA and putting in new segments. Uh, CRISPR is just being approved in medical formulations, uh, but, but that has nothing to do with this vaccine. There's a suggestion that this will interface the recipient, the vaccine recipient with 5G Wi-Fi. That is nonsense. There is no way to inject through a little needle like that, something that is now going to interface with 5G Wi-Fi. Because even if one could introduce a, a small chip and one could through a needle like that, the chip wouldn't have a power source. One has to have a battery power source with it. You say, well, it just gets its power source from the biological system, say from the heat of the body, can't be done. Now, there's many things that have been done in academics and simple experiments, but nothing like that been approved for use in medical applications on human beings, no way. And it's not that we wouldn't want to, I mean, we just, we just don't have the capability. I mean, it, there may be things where we want to put microchips in people and have those microchips run off the actual power source from the body. Uh, but that's very hard to do. Certainly it can be done in an academic framework, but I don't know if anything that's biologically approved, FDA approved or FDA conditionally approved that can do this. They get coated over very quickly with biofilms that make them inactive very quickly. So this interfacing with 5G Wi-Fi is ridiculous. There is no source of graphene, graphene oxide or or carbon nanotubes that are GMP, that are good manufacturing practice approved for insertion into human beings. Plus, the solution would be black. These solutions that are injected into people are clear solutions. If it had graphene, graphene oxide, or carbon nanotubes at any level of concentration uh, uh, that, that's significant, anything, even insignificant, very, very low, these solutions are black but what's injected into people are clear solutions. So you can tell right away because they're highly pi conjugated. If you say that, that one could get a GMP source for a carbon dot, carbon dots are different. And I don't know anybody why would anybody need a carbon dot for this. If you say graphene oxide, graphene oxide is heavily anionic. Uh, the mRNA is anionic. So I don't see any advantage to having graphene oxide into this. Uh, uh, it also would disrupt the lipids. Uh, one could inject via a liposome. Liposomes have been around for a long time. These are lipid bilayer systems. Uh, Doxel is the first drug that I know of that, that uh, uh, was packaged in a liposome. It's a, it's a chemotherapy drug for cancer treatment. And uh, there'll be a reference for this down in the, the description box. If, if one were using a liposomal package for this, there's nothing unusual about this. This is how cells are packaged in this lipid bilayer. But I think the mRNA, just based on some publications, is not so much a lipid bilayer, which is a liposome, cell-like, but more soap-like, where you have a monolayer, where you have a monolayer and you have different groups projecting into this. So it's not a lipid bilayer, but a monolayer, and it's more soap-like. But again, nothing highly unusual about these sorts of structures. Graphene oxide, I've seen videos on this where they say graphene oxide is, is an oxidant and, and it, it causes real problems. Well, graphene oxide surely is an oxidant because it's already heavily oxidized, 
but even my group were working on formulations, none of this approved for, for FDA use or conditionally approved, where the graphene oxide-like materials are so heavily oxidized that they actually oxidize superoxide. So when there's an overabundance of superoxide, it oxidizes these deleterious compounds that when they are made in overabundance and overexpression of superoxide, they'll oxidize superoxide back to oxygen, O2, and hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide is a naturally occurring compound in the body. And if you have excess iron, those can undergo a Fenton reaction to form the hydroxyl radical, which add very nicely into graphene oxide-like derivatives. So, so it sequesters that as well. So none of the chemistry on this made sense. And I'll put several of my publications in the description box. The other thing about graphene oxide is it's not hydrolytically stable meaning that it decomposes very rapidly in water to humic acid, just decomposes just hydrolytically, just in water. And we've published papers on that. That will be in the description box as well. If you say, well, it gets its power much like you would get the power from a, an RFID tag. That's not what's happening because for an RFID tag, you have to have something about two centimeters square for the antenna for an RFID tag. You can't put something two centimeters squared through that needle. And then even if you could, it's not going to immediately splay out like that. So it's very hard to think of technologies. We've built RFID tags out of carbon nanotubes. So I know those sorts of areas. I know the limitations of these things and what can be done. And references to our publications from even more than a decade ago on RFID tags and carbon nanotubes will be in there. So we've been working in these areas for decades and we understand these compounds. So if you want to get the vaccine, that's a personal choice. You weigh the risks. As I said, for me, I weighed the risks of COVID, which I know the risks of COVID, both immediate risk of death, as well as long-term neurological disorders and organ disorders versus the risks of the vaccine. I made a personal choice. Everybody's for personal choices. I made a personal choice for the vaccine, as did my family. You don't want to take the vaccine, don't take the vaccine. That is your choice. It is totally up to you. And so if nanotechnology is causing you, the, the worries of nanotechnology is causing you to not get the vaccine, you can rest. These things are not in there. You're not gonna be interfaced with Wi-Fi. You're not gonna become ferromagnetic. Even though there are free electrons, there are unpaired electrons on, on uh, graphene, graphene oxide, and carbon nanotubes under certain formulation conditions, that would not render the individual ferromagnetic. It would not. There are unpaired electrons, there are unpaired electrons on iron in your hemoglobin. That doesn't render you ferromagnetic. So all of that is a bunch of nonsense. You can rest in that regard. But again, the vaccine choice is up to you. Thank you.